I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversation. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. There is a common misconception that older adults are no longer interested in or capable of having sex. My guest today is Dr. Regina Kep. She is a board-certified clinical psychologist, a clinical geriopsychologist, and founder and director of the Center for Mental Health and Aging. It is the go-to place online for mental health and aging. She is also the creator and host of the Psychology of Aging podcast, is a contributing writer at Psychology Today and Psychotherapy Networker. She's been featured in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Yahoo, News Nation, and other news outlets. Currently, she holds the role of lead medical psychologist at the University of Vermont Medical Center. She is a sought after speaker on the topics of mental health and aging, caregiving, aging, ageism, resilience, sexual health and aging, intimacy, dementia, and sexual expression. And she is the creator of the only dementia and sexual health certification program in the United States. As we're addressing these common misconceptions and the negative impact that these stereotypes can have around sexual health of older adults, we are providing accurate information about sexual health of older adults and promoting healthy sexuality and improving quality of life for all people. In our conversation, we talk about the frequency of sexual activity among older adults, the benefits of sex in later in life, coping strategies for new disabilities or chronic illnesses, how we can be empowered in our sexual expression, and the importance of talking about sexually transmitted infections among older adults. Finally, dementia and sexuality is an important topic to address, and we look at how we can improve education and awareness around this topic, and we look at how healthcare providers and families can better address the sexual health needs of their older adults and loved ones in their life. Here is my interview with Dr. Regina Kapp. Hello. Hi. Hi, we finally meet. I'm so happy to introduce to you Dr. Regina Kep. I have been following along and all that she shares and speaks to. It's a privilege to interview her today. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a long time coming. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, we get to talk about an important topic, one that is not, would you say, like openly talked about that often, I feel like. Oh, you're totally, you're absolutely right. Yeah. People shy away from this topic and we shouldn't, we really need to be talking about it. Mm-hmm. And so we're really setting it up. Yeah. The more we do, the better it's going to be. <laughs> the more we set it up and the more we talk about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. On both accounts, on both accounts. Yes. There's a common misconception that older adults are no longer interested in or capable of having sex. That's what we're going to talk about today. And it was so funny, like as I was preparing for our conversation, the song that came in my head was, let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. And I was like, I wonder if I could play that. It'd probably be like a copyright issue, but I could sing it. <laughs> and like you just did. Yeah, I just did. So we're going to talk about sex today and share with us what are some of those stereotypes, how they impact the sexual health of older adults. And in addition to that, how did you come into, okay, this is like a two-sided question. How did you come into this field to even want to be discussing this and talking to families and older adults and professionals and educating us all about it? Well, I'll start with that question first. Yeah. Like, how did I even get interested in sex? So um, so I'm a, a board-certified clinical psychologist, and I was working in a medical system 
for more than a decade. I'm still working in a medical system, but in this previous medical system for more than a decade. And I was the only Jero psychologist. So that's a psychologist who specializes with older adults in this hospital. And it was at the Atlanta VA healthcare system. And I provided a lot of couples therapy and family therapy to older adults and their partner or to older adults and their family member. And constantly sex would come up. Mm -hmm. It would come up in places you wouldn't expect. So um, really, I came into this topic because older adults brought it to me and I listened. Yeah. And, and so like, for example, I worked with an older family where there was an older man who had Parkinson's disease and he went, he moved from his home in, I'm just going to maybe say the Midwest mm -hmm. and went to live with a family member, his daughter in the South. And he came and he was meeting with me and I asked what some of his concerns were. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm just not doing the things that I was doing in my, in my home when I was living independently. And I said like, well, what would you be doing at home when you lived independently? Mm -hmm. He would say, well, I'd be um, like masturbating to magazines. Yeah. And I say, well, do you have magazines with you? And he'd say, no, I don't have access to them now. Mm -hmm. So I would say, would you like to brainstorm how to get access? Would, would you like me to help you have a conversation with your daughter? His daughter was the only access point to getting groceries and transportation and other kinds of resources. And he said, yes, could you help me talk with my daughter? Okay, would you like to have the conversation, all three of us? Would you like me to talk with her privately? How would you like it to go? Well, I'd like you to talk with her privately about it. Okay. So then I have a conversation with the daughter and I say, you know, your, your dad had an active sex life before he moved down with you and he's really missing it. Mm -hmm. And part of his sex life included magazines. Would you be willing to help him buy some magazines? Because he can't, he doesn't know where to go here. He doesn't have access to transportation without you. And the daughter said, absolutely not. Interesting. I will not help him find mm -hmm. that's against my religious values. I'm absolutely not. I won't allow that in my home and, and I'm not going to help him find that. And so then I went back to him and privately, and I said, I spoke with your daughter and she's not willing to help with this, but I'm happy to brainstorm other ways that we could talk about and find resources for you. And he was dejected and deflated and just mm -hmm. was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to pursue that aspect of my life anymore. And so that's just one small example yeah. of, and, and I never saw him again, actually, mm -hmm. but that's one small example. Other examples are couples, older couples coming to, into my clinic and office wanting to improve their intimacy life. Other people who have a life altering medical condition that impairs functioning, but they still want to be sexual functioning, but they still want to be intimate with their partner or struggle with how to have even conversations about changes in their in their body and sexual functioning, how to even have those conversations with their partner. So really older adults brought it to me and I listened and I think, well, I'm the luckiest person in the world because I am never bored. And, oh, sure. um, and just what a joy to help people live their life fully. Mm -hmm. And, and then in the process, I really just it became a passion project of mine. And it's one of the things I love most in my career is really helping people to cultivate intimacy. And it shows when you share and it's, so digestible and from the outside looking in you probably don't know how many people are witnessing your message but you are one of the few voices that I know I'm sure there are others out there that are really educating and speaking to this and bringing awareness I think it's so important because wouldn't you classify our sexuality as a vital part you know like the hierarchy of needs that fits into such a important role and how we view ourselves and what uh, brings us um, meaning and value. And I know you probably have more of the tools and words to speak to that than I do, but can you just speak, touch on that a little bit? Oh yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. So we all have heard, or most of us have heard about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that's the triangle, if you can imagine in your mind, a triangle where the base of the triangle is your the most essential needs. And then every sort of category up toward the peak of the triangle is just sort of um, building on top of the foundation, but adds more meaning and purpose into your life the higher you get on, on the triangle. So at the base of the triangle though, like 
with eating is at the base, excreting is at the base Mm -hmm. and sex is at the base. And sex actually in Maslow's hierarchy shows up in two different places. It shows up at the base and in the middle in relationships and social functioning. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually very critical to our livelihood. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's related to reproduction, but even people before they're even able to reproduce are engaging in their own sexual expression, like toddlers even. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're not going to go there, but we all know that toddlers even will get curious about their bodies Mm -hmm. and sexually express themselves all the way until we die. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that's quite natural. And of course, there are many complexities that come with sexuality and sexual expression. And I'm looking forward to getting into those, but it's as basic as eating and excreting. Mm -hmm. And then it's also very complex in that it's related to social functioning as well. It is. It's so important. It's so important. I'm so glad we're talking about it. So along the lines of addressing some of those misconceptions, and, you know, we think of that as we age, we might not have interest or we might not maybe be capable What are some of those stereotypes and how does that impact our view of older adults and sexuality and our sexual health? Yeah, you know, so often when I meet with family members about how to optimize the sexual health of their loved one, especially if their loved one has dementia or if their loved one has Parkinson's disease or some other condition, sometimes the response is, they're still interested. Like, shouldn't they be over that by now? Right. This idea that at a certain time in our life, we're no longer interested or able to perform sexually or have a desire to be desired or a desire to desire somebody else. Right. So there are lots of misconceptions about that. One misconception is that older adults are asexual. They're no longer interested in sex. If an older adult is interested in sex, it's perverse and or deviant, like that that somehow it's no longer normal. Or this idea that like sex is comical if mm-hmm. when people are older. Yeah. So like we've all heard of the villages in Florida mm-hmm. and some of the sexcapades that happen there, but people get like, start making fun of it and mocking it. And right. I'm hoping to talk about um, sexually transmitted infections today yeah. to talk about like, if we're talking about sexually transmitted infections, so often I'll hear people laugh about older mm-hmm. adults having sexually transmitted infections. And I'm thinking like, would you laugh at any other age group with STDs? Like, no, that's very cruel. And, and so it's, there are lots of stereotypes and misconception or that somehow if um, we've always been in an opposite sex relationship and then all of a sudden we're in the same sex relationship when we're older, that somehow we're confused or Mm. (laughs) like can't make a sound judgment when in fact, sexuality shifts and changes all throughout our life and, and, There are many reasons we might be with the same sex partner, even if we've only been with an opposite sex partner earlier in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so just these ideas that sexuality is fixed, that older people are rigid and shouldn't be engaging in sexuality or that it's gross or perverse. Those are all really concerning to me because I'm looking forward to have a vibrant future. And I want, if any, if other people are interested in that, I want them to have a vibrant Mm -hmm. sexual future as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the conversation to be expressed in a way that gives other people the permission to share and explore and talk about it as we continue to age, right? As as we're surrounded by our peers and families, that we can also be given the tools and the words to share how we want our sex life to be when we're older. It's important. Yeah. So, okay, let's talk about some of the numbers, maybe. How often are older adults having sex? What does the sex life look like as we age from maybe what people assume it to be to what it actually is? Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, if we assume it's it to be zero, Mm -hmm. yeah, (laughs) then it actually is. So there was a survey done. The survey was done in 2018, but people are publishing based on the results of that survey years after. So survey done in 2018 of 3,000 adults ages 65 to 80. So that's an older adult population. And hopefully they'll start looking at people over 80. But Mm -hmm. um, but this survey was 65 to 80 and found that more than 50, 50% of men and more than 30% of women were sexually active in that age group. Yeah. And then in that study, they also found that people who were in a relationship 
the vast majority of people in a romantic relationship were satisfied with their sexual life. Mm, that's good to know, right? We've got to oh, yeah. That. yeah, absolutely. So do you find that older adults are not talking about their sex life as openly, but obviously the numbers should prove <laughs> that they're actively engaging in it? Yeah. So research shows that older adults actually do want to talk about their sex mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. and about optimizing sexual functioning and about figuring out sexual health. And what one of the challenges is that they prefer, like research shows, they prefer to talk about sex with their doctor. Mm -hmm. The problem is the doctor isn't talking about sex with them. Yeah. And so in this same study, they looked at okay, how often are older adults having this conversation with their doctor? And it found like 17 percent mm. were actually having this conversation with their doctor. And when they were having a conversation about sex with their doctor, the older adult was the one bringing it up, not the doctor. And so it has to be very patient driven in a medical encounter, which when there are all sorts of other priorities mm -hmm. in your medical visit with your doctor, that's 15 minutes, it's going to be hard to prioritize sex if you're there for heart disease or right what our COPD or whatever else you're there for. And so conversations just aren't happening, but they need to be happening. They do. Yeah. The, yeah. It's like those other pressing needs take priority over, even though we know long-term this is a very pressing need. Are you seeing too that there's like cultural or society attitudes towards aging and sexuality that also impact the provider's perspective or our ability to have those conversation and kind of address some of those issues? Yeah. Well, I think the same stereotypes that plague the rest of us plague mm -hmm. doctors. Mm -hmm. So the same stereotypes that at a certain age, people shouldn't be interested in sex or are no longer interested in sex or it doesn't function anymore. I think is impacts doctors the same as it impacts you and me. Mm -hmm. I think the the level of education and training doctors get and even psychologists or therapists get related to sexual health is really low in terms of the numbers of hours of training for medical and mental health professionals to even talk about sex with mm -hmm. older adults. And then I think there's another variable, which is around ableism. So which is like bias and discrimination based on people who have disabilities. And so if you're older, like as I age, my risk for disability is higher and my risk for medical vulnerability is higher. And so there is a misconception too, that when we acquire medical problems or we acquire a disability that all of a sudden we're no longer interested in sex. And that's also not true, but the medical system is also a victim to that kind of right. thinking that when we have a disability, we're no longer interested in sex or we can't perform. And so um, while I was at the Atlanta VA, I also was the psychologist for a spinal cord injury clinic. Mm. So a lot of my patients were paralyzed from the neck or waist down due to all sorts of like maybe gunshot wound, um, car accidents, whatever. And what was really important to many people with living with spinal cord injury is how to maintain intimacy and sexual functioning, mm. even when my body doesn't work yeah. the way it used to. And so what I discovered in my decade of working with people with spinal cord injuries is there are very creative ways to get your body working, even if your mind can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so people with disabilities make very creative lovers and shouldn't be a rule out for sexual intimacy. Right. That leads to my next thought was there are common challenges maybe that as we age, we might be facing. And so when it comes to our sexual health or sexual activity, what are some of those maybe common hurdles that we have to cross and how can we address that? Well, we all know the bridge, the menopause bridge, mm -hmm. right? So that's a hurdle and that can change sexual function. That's early in our aging experience, right? So that's in uh, the average age is 50 or 51 mm -hmm. of menopause. For men, there's andropause, which is the slow decline of testosterone over time. So instead of for women, it ha happens as sort of this crescendo for men, it can happen slowly over time. So th those are just kind of two things that can impact sexual functioning, but mm -hmm. You know, heart disease can impact sexual functioning, diabetes, pain, arthritis, Parkinson's disease, yeah. stroke, dementia disorders, even medications for these conditions can impact our sexual functioning and mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, substance use disorders mm -hmm. can all impact sexual functioning. Yeah. However, that doesn't mean it's the end of the story. 
So I was just collaborating this week, in fact, with the American Parkinson's Disease Association on a book that they have that's just come out called Parkin's Sex. Mm -hmm. And and it's this fabulous book and kit to help couples reignite sort of sensuality in their relationship. So for, for folks living with Parkinson's disease, sexual functioning might not be possible anymore because of physiological changes in the brain and neuromuscular functioning. However, people still desire intimacy. Right. And so Parkinson's sex is this really cool free kit from the American Parkinson's Disease Association that helps couples to stimulate curiosity and sensuality and intimate time with one another. And so even though there are maybe risks to sexual functioning as we age, it doesn't mean that intimacy has to be thrown out when our erection is no longer an option for us or lubrication is just too hard to come by. Yeah. And the sensuality, there's many ways that we can express ourselves in that way. And I love that message of hope that you're offering. It's like looking at it that, yes, there might be some hurdles to overcome, but there are ways that we can make that be a part of our lives and not have to give up hope that this is not going to be something that we can engage in, but we can in the, in the different ways that we can do that. Yeah. And I will just say, you know, to not sound too Pollyanna mm-hmm. around this, I'm going to, I'm going to take it at another turn in the conversation that I do think when we're experiencing a chronic and life altering condition that there is a necessary grieving process. Like it it might be that you step out of intimacy and sexuality with your partner or even yourself as you're getting to know your body as it is now. Mm. That's a very common thing. It's a major adjustment to come to terms with a life-altering medical condition. And so it doesn't happen overnight that you might desire intimacy and it might not happen at all for you and your partner might desire intimacy and you might not anymore. And, and I think that's an important conversation to have with your partner about like how to find some, some space in the middle, but there is, I think for many people who have acquired new medical or mental health conditions or using medications that knock you out or make you feel tired or fuzzy or whatever it is, that there is a process of coming to terms and grieving and establishing a new normal and optimal health for yourself. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to that. That's important. I was visiting with a woman who uh, had had cancer and we were talking about part of that is for her story addressing the intimacy because with the medications and the diagnosis, it definitely, there was that grieving period and readjustment, right? You get to know yourself in a new, in a new way, in ways that we haven't had to do before. So. And your relationship too. I mean, when one person in the relationship is sick, Mm -hmm. it shifts the relationship. So if you're providing care and, and your partner is receiving care, the dynamics shift and it, for many people, it can be hard to find intimacy because it feels like a patient nurse dynamic, or some people, depending on the condition, will describe being infantilized and treated like a child. Or I think the shifts in relationship can really impact sexual functioning. And I'll work with many caregivers who will say, like, I don't want to be a caregiver anymore. I just want to be the wife or the spouse or the, or the husband or the partner. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't want to be the caregiver right now. And I just want to be their partner. And it's so hard to turn off caregiving and turn on intimacy. And so I think that's also a very real struggle in in terms of relationship dynamics Mm -hmm. and the relationship has a medical illness or life altering condition. And sometimes both members of the relationship do. Right. So that is a big question. What do you offer for people in that dynamic? Is there some, I don't know if tips is the right word. It's probably not the right word. In conversation, what do you share with them to help them navigate that that challenge? Yeah, I think one is there's a saying to bring the implicit explicit, just to identify what's happening in the relationship when one member is sick or has a condition or has a change in their functioning, I think can help to just contain all the feelings related to that. Mm -hmm. So just calling it out, having an opportunity to process it, having opportunities for each member of the relationship to really describe what this experience is like for them. So for the person who has 
a new diagnosis or a long-term diagnosis to really say, you know, this stage of my life living with diabetes, this is what it's like for me. And then the partner or the caregiver to say, yeah, I get that. And to really listen. And so sometimes I'll, I'll be helping therapeutically the partner to really listen. Mm -hmm. And then, and then to give a turn for the partner to say, and for me, I really miss our intimate life. Or sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes the person with the medical condition misses the intimacy more than the caregiver does, but whatever the true feelings are for each member of the relationship to be able to fully express what's going on for them and the other member to really listen. And then if you're asking for tips on cultivating intimacy, I have some of those. Yeah, because what that's something I want to talk to is that when we are coping with those chronic illnesses and that you touched on and all of that is how do we yeah, get to that place? Well, I think the first thing to do is to schedule time for intimacy. So one of the challenges, of course, when we're living with a condition and have a busy life is that everything else takes priority. And so then intimacy falls to the bottom of the list and then we never have it because we never prioritize it. Mm -hmm. And so I would schedule time for intimacy. And if you're living with a chronic medical condition, then I would invite you to think about when your body and your mind is at its best and try to schedule for that time. Mm -hmm. So if you know you take your meds at a certain time of day and they really knock you out, don't schedule time for intimacy at that time of day. So um, really be conscientious and mindful about setting yourself up for success. Then the second is to really like set the mood. And so really cherish that this is a special time that you're designating just for intimacy and maybe light a candle, put on some music, make it in your bedroom, which is where most people enjoy intimacy, especially like wherever you're most comfortable, if you have some physical pain and, and get comfortable and get cozy and get in the mood, turn off all distractions, um, make sure nobody's going to come knocking at your door, right? No interruptions. No interruptions. Yeah. Really set yourself and your partner up for success. And then the third thing I like to say is to manage your sex expectations. Mm. So in terms of like managing sex expectations, it might not be that climax or orgasm or erection is possible and that's okay. The end goal, if you're living with a chronic medical condition and that's not possible, then to consider having something that's achievable as your goal for intimacy, like just time spent together caressing each other or time spent um, reminiscing, which is my my next point, or time spent sort of um, in in a sensual exploration with each other, but maybe orgasm or erection is not possible and that's okay. So to really manage your expectations with your body and to get curious about your body. Yeah. Okay. I like that term. I'm going to... I'm going to use that (laughs) sex expectations. Yeah. And then I like people to like have a beginner's mind with their body when they're living with new um, limitations. And so like, instead of focusing on what my body can't do anymore, which is important if you're grieving, but I would say to leave the grief out of, out of this special time and to really focus on like, get curious about what my body can do now. Maybe my body can't have an erection or an orgasm. Fine. That I'm going to get curious about how, what my body can experience. Can I have a feather touch my skin and is that sensual and arousing at some, in some form and really focus on like the tiny little experiences that can add up to a, a magnificent sensual experience. Right. And then I would say to communicate with your partner, like communication is key. So there are a couple of ways to communicate one about like, if you're in pain or a position is not working for you to express that and to say, let's try something else. So instead of just to shut it down, to offer what might work. So to really be clear, my body is not able to do that. Now let's try this instead. And so um, to really communicate about what you're okay with, what you're not okay with, what works for your body, what doesn't, and to listen to your partner too, about what they're okay with, what they're not okay with. And then in terms of communicating, I would say like to reminisce about times that you were very, um, like the most intimate in your relationship Mm -hmm. and super aroused. And then to describe those experiences in detail. Like I'll remember with my husband, we were dating and he would pick me up at my apartment and we would have like the most passionate embraces when he would like pick me up. And it was so thrilling. And sometimes even, you know, we're in our late forties, we have two little kids. We had kids late in life. Our lives are, our lives are crazy busy. 
And sometimes we'll, we'll be out of touch intimately and we'll say like, remember that time, remember when you would come and pick me up and it will like spark some of those, the arousal that was, is in there from early times in our relationship. And so I would invite you and your relationship to reminisce about the times that you were the most sensual with your partner, and then to describe them in detail with one another and to share in that experience. And that can get like the juices flowing a little bit. Yeah, the words. Isn't there a saying too, where it's like our mind is our like first sex organ or something like that, where it's like we can tap into those those memories and emotions. I think especially for women Mm -hmm. that the foreplay is in the conversations. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it is. The final thing I would say is just to leave judgment at the door and let yourself really explore this new body of yours, this new stage of life that you're in, and also like this new experience in your relationship. And so to just be open to trying new things and leave judgment outside. Yeah. I think too, it's getting over our hurdle of sometimes the shyness when we're in a new place in our health or our body and just having to overcome some of that. So when we can leave that judgment, we're able to just embrace where we are to some extent, as hard as it is. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. I think you're so right that it is also about like us getting to know our body, but sharing it with somebody else also helps us to get to know our body in a new way. And it can be scary and intimidating and it can be so also rewarding and life enhancing. Yeah. Okay. On the lines of rewarding and life enhancing, there are so many benefits, but what are those when we're looking at later in life? Yeah. So there are myriad benefits. So psychological, physiological, cognitive, spiritual. So I'm going to start with the cognitive because it's it's like one where you get a lot of bang for your buck. Yeah. I'm like noticing all of the sexual inno- innuendos I'm saying. <laughs> We'll just keep going. Yeah. (laughs) So, in terms of cognitive benefits, there was a study done a couple of years ago that looked at people who had older adults who had more frequent sexual activity. And I think it was actually looking at sexual intercourse, Mm -hmm. actually scored better on cognitive tests than people who had less sexual intercourse. So, you know, I think some of that can be um, understood by like the healthier the heart, the healthier the brain. And if you're able to have sexual intercourse, that shows a healthy heart, a healthy enough heart. And so that that might be kind of related to why that why that's there. But it's a fun it's a fun finding, mm-hmm. nonetheless. I think there are like many psychological benefits. So people who have more frequent sexual interaction and intimacy have have lower rates of depression, anxiety. And you can imagine too, when we feel more connected to somebody and where our dopamine levels are kicked in, which happens when we're having sex and oxytocin, which is another cuddle hormone is kicked up. That helps to lower our risk for depression, anxiety, and other other mood disorders. And so that's a psychological benefit. There are spiritual benefits and that people kind of feel when they're, when they're deeply connected to somebody, they experience a spiritual sort of, um, awe and wonder and connection. Mm -hmm. And there's an act of reciprocity and generosity that can be interpreted as spiritual and active giving and receiving. And then relationally, actually people who are engaged in older people who are engaged in an intimate relationship report being very happy in their relationship and as they age. And so it, it just contributes to overall wellness. And I will say intimacy does this very similar things. And so even if you can't engage in sexual activity, like you once could, like with intercourse, that intimacy still also increases the dopamine and oxytocin and is really in the sense of connection and togetherness, which is really critical for health and well-being. Yeah. Do we gain those same benefits when we're having a sexual relationship with ourselves through that? Yeah. Is it- I'm, I'm get, I think I think it's an excellent question that I don't know the research on, yeah. but here's what I, my guesses are. My guess is that that in terms of cognitive functioning, probably, Mm -hmm. although if we're only masturbating and we're not engaged socially with other people and we're just kind of a hermit loner, then, then probably not as beneficial for our cognitive health. And then, so I would say that there's a social component that's really important. There are probably some 
benefits to masturbation and just an active sex life, a solo sex life, some physiological benefits and some um, psychological benefits. Mm -hmm. But I would say like for the most thing right. for your book, right? The, um, the big benefits. Yeah. It's yeah. the relational, the intimacy. Yeah. So like, I think you could control for that by getting out and just socializing with people who you really enjoy spending time with. Mm, yeah. So if you, if you don't want to have a sexual relationship with a partner, fine, but you just enjoy your own self. Great. Mm -hmm. Then just also build some friendships that yeah. add meaning and value to your life. Find that socialization and connection and then those other ways. So on the other side, we've got benefits, but we also have the conversation around sexually transmitted infections. And among older adults, what are the statistics with that and some of those conversations we need to talk about? Yeah, I'm so glad we're talking about this because this is a public health uh, urgency, right. I'll say. Yes. Yeah. So um, in the last 10 years, STI, so the sexually transmitted infections, and I'm going to tell you which ones they are, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis have doubled for people 65 and older Wow! in terms of um, new diagnoses. And so that's a big deal. Yeah. At the same time, HIV has maintained, has just been consistent. It hasn't doubled. Older adults are still getting diagnosed with HIV, but not at, with the same increased rates as other STDs. Okay. And I'm going to share a little bit about why. So with chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, sometimes the symptoms of those that show up in the doctor's office, the doctor might not be assuming to, to do mm -hmm. uh, a drug a, a or screening. even test for, right? Yeah. Right. Because there's an assumption that older adults aren't having sex. So that the symptoms might be more like a cognitive disorder. So maybe they're going to look into a cognitive disorder instead of a sexually transmitted infection and which could be treated. So that's one issue is that because doctors aren't talking with older adults about sex, they aren't testing as readily as, as they need to, or talking about sexual health and protection. Like one of the other reasons that STIs are on the rise is because older adults didn't have sex education really in schools. Like we started to, when I was growing up in the eighties, but now there's like prominent sex education everywhere. And, and the big concern was around pregnancy. And many older adults will say when they're starting a new relationship, well, I don't have to worry about getting yeah. pregnant, but you do need to worry about STIs. So use a condom or ask your partner to use a condom exactly. and get tested and make sure you're getting treatments for, there are good treatments for STIs. So get tested and get treated if you need to. And then, yeah. you know, be a responsible partner, yeah. be a responsible sex partner. Are there guidelines with testing? Do you recommend, mm -hmm. is it every time you have a new partner? Is it every month? Are there certain parameters? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say my, I think everybody will have their own threshold, mm -hmm. but I would say um, when you're starting a new partnership and you're not going to be using protection, I recommend test getting tested. The, I think one of the beautiful things about HIV is that HIV, there's been so much education and public education about HIV and about getting tested mm -hmm. and about um, the use of antiretrovirals. And so the reason why HIV is not on the rise, I mean, people are still getting diagnosed with HIV, mm -hmm. but not at the same rates is because let me just give some basic facts about HIV yeah. and aging. So um, more than 50% of people living with HIV right now are 50 years old or older. And so um, many of the people living with HIV now have been living with HIV for decades. And because they're using antiretrovirals, that's helping them to live a long life, which mm -hmm. is fabulous. And also with the use of antiretroviral, which is like the medication that you take for HIV, it reduces the amount of virus in your system. And so it reduces um, your risk for be, for exposing other people. So when your viral load is low, your um, risk of infecting other people is low as well. And so people um, with HIV who are well educated about HIV and engaged in care are paying attention to their viral load and the risk that they're giving to other people. So they tend to be pretty responsible. The other is like with PrEP. So PrEP is a prophylaxis where if you know you have HIV, you could take PrEP and then re reduce your risk of exposing anybody else to HIV. Mm. So there's some really good tools to help people yeah. sort of maintain sexual health. But I would say if you're engaging in sexual relationships, 
to use a condom unless you're confident that you and your partner are monogamous. And then, and then it, when you're starting a new relationship, I would recommend folks get tested. Um, and, and then it, depending on your level of comfort to share your results with one another and then right. have fun, have the conversation. Yeah. Have yeah. fun, have fun freely. Right. When you know that everything's in place, are there certain resources that are available for older adults? If they're wanting to learn more about like sexual health and wellness, safe sex practices, all of yeah. that. Yeah. CDC has some great um, safe sex practice recommendations, even like how to use a condom. And so even it's great if people are listening who work in long-term care, Mm -hmm. there are some, uh, even people with dementia have sex, right? So, um, CDC has some very helpful tools for showing people how to put a condom on. And, and so it actually has illustrations of how to put on a condom, use a condom, but CDC has great sexual health recommendations and tools Okay, that's great. And you just Google CDC yeah. sex recommendations. Okay, thank you. So you brought that up with the dementia. Uh, what about dementia and sexuality? Can you talk a little bit more about that? I know that's a whole other podcast, but for the sake of today, we'll touch on it a little bit. Yeah. So the first thing that usually comes up when I say, I tell people, well, I I specialize with dementia and sexual health. They'll say dementia and sexual health. I never thought about that. And then they'll say, can people with dementia have sex? And then they'll say, can people with dementia consent Mm. to having sex? And so I'll just answer a couple of those questions. The need for intimacy doesn't change because a person has dementia first, right? Second, I think it's really important that for professionals who are listening, many professionals have an ethics code where we are in our ethics code, have to honor a person's fundamental right to their personhood Mm -hmm. and their humanity and their sexual expression. On the other hand, as professionals and as caregivers who are listening, we also have a responsibility to keep people who have impairments safe from harm, right? And so it creates a a massive dilemma for people, loved ones and professionals caring for people with dementia who are sexually expressive. Because on one hand, we have to honor their dignity and humanity and rights. And on the other hand, we have to keep them safe from harm. And so how do we do that? And so this poses a lot of complications for families and for long-term care communities. And the answer is that it's very complicated and it's really on a case-by-case basis. And so there are guidelines for consent. Also, it's just to, to kind of like we're doing today to just get clear about who's having sex, how often they're having sex, what's normal in aging and sexuality, because dementia is a disease that's more common in older adulthood. It's important that we're aware of sexuality, just basics in older adulthood, um, so that we don't pathologize people who have dementia, who are also sexually expressive. Mm -hmm. The other thing, the complication with dementia is that people often will have a hard time regulating their emotions and impulses with dementia. And so people with dementia can at times be hypersexual. And so a dilemma that often arises in care communities or for families is how do I know if this is typical or okay, or how do I know if this is hypersexual? And I think this is where training is critical for both families and for long-term care communities. And, um, and I have some training programs around A course yeah. that we can. And so what is the name of that if people want to be able to access that? Yeah, yeah. So I have a one hour dementia and sexual health course that would be great for anyone. And that's on the Center for Mental Health and Aging website at mentalhealthandaging.com. And I think the course is dementia and sexual health, the basics. Mm-hmm. And so It's just a basics course and it's pretty affordable. It's less than $40. And you get a one hour video course with me and it's pre-recorded, but you get to learn about dementia and sex and the basics. Yeah. So important. Yeah. So how do you uh, advise professionals? So case by case basis, having that education, are you seeing that uh, clinicians and healthcare providers are uh, open to that conversation and wanting to dive into that a little bit more. I feel like when I worked in a community, it was something that most management did not want to really have to address, (laughs) if I'm being honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that is 
true Mm -hmm. that uh, for different reasons, for many reasons, Mm -hmm. though, I think what we do know is that even in long-term care communities among people living with dementia, almost every long-term care community will have somebody expressing themselves sexually and that we need to have these conversations and, and without them, you could be violating human rights and dignity and humanity. And without them, you could also be exposing people to harm if they're not protected. And so, and I've seen long-term care communities on that spectrum where on one one hand, the care community is very restrictive and it's a no hand, it's a hands-off policy all around. And so there's, there's no intimate connection whatsoever, which I think is a tragedy. On the other hand, I've seen communities not have any sexual health understanding or policies or guidelines or guidance in navigating sexual health. And it's just a free-for-all and it's very risky. Yeah. And so, and I've trained ombudsmen on this process. So Mm -hmm. the Illinois ombudsman group attended one of my training programs and were sharing with me that there were communities in Illinois that were fined $400,000 for violations Mm -hmm. because they didn't have policies and guidelines in place. And so what I recommend is really getting sexual health policies and getting sexual consent guidelines in place so that your staff really know how to help navigate these complex situations and also how to inform families about what's typical, what's not typical, what to do when there are concerns so that it's not just a knee-jerk reaction when people are engaged in intimacy, that there's actually like, we're going to do our best to honor the dignity of the person. Yeah and to keep them safe from harm. And this is how we do it. Right. And we can find all of that information with you, which is so great that you're speaking to that. You have such an extensive background and expertise. I was, you know, I know what you are doing, but I was actually reading through everything that you've done and accomplished and it's incredible. So I'm so happy that you're here and can share with us and people can learn more. So First, tell us in the various ways you are supporting older adults, families, and professionals, and then where we can connect with you in that way. Oh, yeah, sure. So a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, I started the Center for Mental Health and Aging. And so this is an online resource, which I call the go-to place for mental health and aging, but it um, is an online resource that gives lots of just free information to families and older adults about mental health and sexual health and aging. And then for professionals, there are courses that you can take for continuing education, and that's all at mentalhealthandaging.com. We have lots of different courses that you can take, and, and actually I'm expanding in the process of expanding the sexual health library for courses as well. But so since we're talking about sex, upcoming is a sexual uh, health and aging three-hour continuing education course for professionals. There's that dementia and sexual health basics course. And I have a certification program for dementia and sexual health as well, which is a long 15-hour, mm. five-week program. Right. And who would take that? Would it be healthcare professionals? Okay. okay. Yeah. So that program is geared toward healthcare professionals, but the basics course, really anybody could yeah, take. I know I might need to jump on there. I also have a podcast called the psychology of aging podcast. You can find that on that website or at any place that you listen to podcasts. I interview experts. And so you'll find lots of experts there. It's both, it's free to listen to. Um, if you're a professional, you can earn continuing education for listening to some of the courses. So check that out if you like listening to podcasts. My goal was really to democratize access to mental health education mm. that is evidence based and expert driven so that, you know, people in some of the most vulnerable situations have access to the most credible resources. Thank you. Yeah. And I need CEUs for one of a certification I have. So I'm going to check that out. (laughs) I thank you so much. And we'll include all of those links in our show notes so people can, when they're listening to the podcast, just be directed right to where you are. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. I've learned so much. So many new terms. Thank you so much. I've appreciated it. And I'm so glad we finally get to talk. Thank you. What new terms? Oh my gosh. It was the one about the men that have the slow. Andropause. Yes. Andropause. I've never heard that term before. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Now I know. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Oh, and the sex. What was it? The sex sex expectations. (laughs) The expectations. Now I'm equipped. Yeah. Thank you. 
this great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. <laughs> In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.